So just to make sure before I get started, is there anyone else that wants to bump me back a little further? <laughs> I'm just kidding, it's fine. So I rotated here back in August and uh, the other couple weeks with Dr. Bernstein. And when I was working with him, we had this really interesting patient come in, actually an unusual finding. Um, so basically what I'm gonna do is just pretty briefly present her case and uh, uh, show some of the imaging and then uh, talk about a really quick differential and then basically just open it up, see if anyone else has other thoughts or ideas or comments. Um, so th this was a 30 year old that came in uh, with the chief complaint of uh, no vision in the left eye. So she, since childhood, she, she never remembers having good vision in the eye. She does remember that as a child she could, she could see somewhat, but she can't really describe how well it was. And that over her lifetime, um, it has been slowly getting worse um, with, with no problems in the right eye. She didn't have any associated pain in the eye, uh, no other visual symptoms as far as flashes or anything like that. And the reason that she was referred, she hadn't had any recent new problems, but her primary care physician wanted to just make sure that everything was okay in the right eye, that she was still seeing well, and uh, the right eye was being taken care of. Um, so as far as a, an ocular history, she remembers being diagnosed uh, with amblyopia as a, as a child. She had had some patching done on her right eye, but it never really helped vision in the left. Um, like I said, it continued to just slowly deteriorate over years. And then back in 2002, um, she had seen Dr. Harry, and so she knew she'd been diagnosed with, with some kind of mass and a retinal detachment in the left eye. And going back to her records, at that time she was seeing hand movements. Um, she had a pretty significant uh, visual field defect, but she did have some vision out of that eye. Um, she, she hasn't had any other previous treatments. Me medical history is only significant for Graves' disease, which is pretty well controlled with Methinazil. Um, so on exam, her right eye is seeing at 2015, and her left eye had no light perception. Um, pressure was equal at 21 in both eyes. And uh, the right eye had a reactive pupil, the left eye had a, a afferent pupillary defect, leukocoria. Slit lamp exam was otherwise completely normal on both sides. Um, so looking at her fundoscopic exam, so this uh, you can see this is the, the finding for the left eye. You can see it's, it's this really large mass that you can't even keep in focus um, when you're looking at the rest of the fundus, but it's a, here's one that's focused back a little bit more on the mass. But you can see it's this, this really extensive uh, calcified mass that's underlying a, an exudated retinal detachment. And you can see the, the superior boundary of this. Um, you can see the area of retinal detachment and uh, some pigmentary changes there and the inferior boundary along with some uh, kind of just artifact on the photo. Um, and then also interestingly on her exam, and this will kind of play into our differential, but she had this capillary hemangioma on the left side of her face, pretty close to her ear. And obviously this isn't a picture of our patient, but um, it looked somewhat similar to this. Um, <laughs> We weren't examining the belly button or anything like that. Um, so something to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah. So our next step was to uh, refer the patient back to Dr. Harry where uh, she had an ultrasound done. And Dr. Harry brought the results of that ultrasound and is gonna spend just a couple minutes talking about that. shows the lesion back in 2002 when I first saw her and she kind of stayed over time so this is why this quality is not so good of a view scan but this is the lesion here and uh, it measured uh, about seven millimeters in thickness by about uh, uh, 
13 and a half by 15 and a half in basic dimensions. This is the A scan. So here's the lesion here, the surface. Here's the sclera. So internally, it's kind of highly sclerotic, kind of regular, and it was rather vascular at that time. These sites are kind of moving off in the deep center of the footprint, consistent with uh, vascularity. This is the most recent exam, just uh, a couple months ago in September. And here's the B scan of the lesion here. And the actual basal dimensions are pretty close to the same. It's about, uh, it's about 14 by 15 and a half. Uh, but there's also calcification, covering the cerebral this bright mysterious calcium, excuse me, shadowing of the orbit, which is consistent with calcification. And the A scan here uh, kind of internally looks uh, the same, but it is bigger. It's about two millimeters thicker compared to the previous measurement, which is about seven, which is about nine. And such as uh, it has been growing slowly over the nine year period. But it is, again, vascular, which is important to differential abdomen we're talking about. All right, thanks. So we're getting the B scan consistent with the vascularized mass with surfa ca surface calcification. And importantly, there's, n there's not a significant change in size. Um, maybe some slow growth over, over that time. So thinking about a differential for a vascularized uh, mass and kind of thinking back to that hemangioma that we saw close to the ear, kind of the top of the differential is, is a, a retinal capillary hemangioma. So capillary hemangiomas, these are uh, relatively common benign vascular proliferations that uh, most commonly occur in females. And these are, these are usually seen in infancy. So there will be two phases where shortly after birth, at about 8 to 18 months of age, you'll see a period of rapid proliferation. And then that's followed by basically a long period of over many years of slow regression and involution. So half of these will be completely gone by age 5, 75% by age 7. In rare cases, they'll never completely regress. And then there, there's another form of these called congenital hemangiomas. And these are the main thing that sets these apart is rather than coming on shortly after birth, these are present at birth. And uh, there's two, two forms of these. They're either rapidly involuting or non-involuting. Um, so the rapidly involuting are completely gone by age two. And of course, the non-involuting hemangiomas, they grow in proportion to the patient throughout life, and they never regress. Um, so I think it's, it's a, a good possibility that our patient either had um, one of these infantile hemangiomas that never fully regressed, or one of these congenital hemangiomas that was the non-involuting type and um, kind of grew in proportion to her throughout her life. I think that's, that's consistent with slowly worsening vision over her life and a, a slowly growing intraocular mass. Um, and that's a piece of history that uh, I'll still need to get from her as far as if she, of course she's not gonna remember, but if, if anyone remembers, if she had this at birth, the, the hemangioma on her face. Um, so, so less likely possibility is uh, Coates disease or a Coates lesion. So this is a disease of retinal telangiectasias that lead to exudative retinal detachment. Um, and it's, it's much more common in young males, which makes this less likely. Um, there, there is a range of severity here. But in, in the most severe forms, you can get these large masses with exudative retinal detachments, and it, it can lead to total retinal detachments and, and blindness in the eye. And then um, a third and even less likely possibility, just based on um, the rarity of, of these, is what's called a retino retinoma or retinocytoma. And these are a benign retinal tumor that are somewhat related to retinoblastoma in that if you remember the RB1 gene and the two-hit hypothesis of, of getting a retinoblastoma, these have the same two hits in that RB1 gene. But what they're lacking is further downstream mutations that are required in order to fully express retinoblastoma. These are originally thought to be regressed retinoblastomas, but they're now th thought to be a, a separate entity. And two to 10% of carriers of the RB1 gene are found to have these. Um, and there, there have been a few case reports of these uh, transforming into retinoblastoma, so it's thought that these could possibly be pre-malignant. And I, I also did read that there is some, some reports of actual spontaneously regressed retinoblastomas as well. Um, so 
uh, kind of my thoughts on this case is, uh, re regardless of, of specifically what type of lesion this is, we know that it's not rapidly increasing in size, and we know that there's no more visual potential in the left eye and it's not bothering the patient. So um, I, th I think the goal of management will be to carefully monitor this lesion and to make sure that care in the right eye is optimized, that uh, sh she has at least annual exams uh, to make sure everything's okay in the right eye and otherwise uh, watchful, uh, basically just, just close monitoring of this intraocular mass in the left eye. So any other thoughts, comments, Dr. Bernstein or Dr. Harry or anyone else? It's, I, I think that's something to think about. Again, I think work is not really bothering her and the reason that she came was to make sure care was okay for the right eye. I don't. I don't see necessarily a, a purpose in it besides just for curiosity's sake, but I think it should be. <laughs> like she did before. I'm not actually sure exactly what the testing for that is either. Yeah. <laughs>